So welcome to this first of a five-part video series on trade wind inversions. In this first video here, we're going to take a look at just what exactly is a trade wind inversion. In a subsequent video, we'll take a look at the climatology of trade wind inversions, focusing on the subtropical eastern North Pacific Ocean. From there, we'll dive into the lapse rate tendency equation, which combines a number of meteorological factors that influence the strength as well as the altitude of the trade wind inversion. And so as we move forward, we can take our trade wind inversion term and break it down into two components here, trade wind and inversion. And ultimately, if we think about trade wind, that gives us a mental cue as to a location. We know that the trade winds are found in the tropics and in the subtropics. They emanate out of the subtropical anticyclones and then spread in an easterly direction down toward the equator, all things being equal. And so by trade wind, we're thinking about where these features may be found, largely from the tropics and into the subtropics. And when we think about inversion, there's a very particular sounding structure that comes to mind, something where temperature increases or is relatively constant with increasing height. And so that's ultimately what we are thinking of with inversion here, a particular sounding structure, though we haven't said a lot about what specific type of inversion, what specific type of sounding structure that we see yet. And that's what we're going to dive into over the course of later parts of this video here. So if we take a little bit of a step back to our tropical climatology lecture, way back in the first week of the semester here, we took a look at this sounding, uh, not in terms of a skew T, the pressure is a linear scaling, and our temperature, our isotherms are just straight up and down, but it still gives us the same idea as to what we would expect to see in terms of the sounding structure. We're looking at St. Helena Island in the tropical South Atlantic, here about a third of the way closer to Africa as compared to South America to the west here. And in this sounding structure, we see a boundary layer that has a temperature that decreases from about 17 Celsius to about 10 degrees Celsius over about a kilometer in depth. And then we see a very rapid increase in temperature with height to a temperature that's 20 degrees Celsius or more. And so we have a very rapid increase of temperature within a very shallow layer. Even the zoomed in view here shows that this increase is a very, very shallow layer. We're separating two air masses, the boundary layer air mass which has one set of properties from the free troposphere, which has another set of properties here. So what ultimately gives rise to this inversion structure? And as we'll see, this sounding here over the tropical South Atlantic is going to be pretty characteristic of where we're looking at for these trade wind inversions, primarily over the open oceans. And we'll give particular focus to the eastern North Pacific as that's where we have the most data available to us. So this allows us to ask and hopefully answer two questions. One, why do we have trade wind inversions? What gives rise to that rapid increase in temperature? And as we'll see, rapid decrease in dew point with increasing height. And then once we know why we have them, we can ask and hopefully answer the question, why are they most common over the open oceans? And in particular, during the summertime months. So let's take a step back and take a look at the Hadley cell circulation. It's a nice schematic that I found online here that shows that it's relatively warm and moist here near to the equator. I'll denote that here with a little bit of ink. And so we have flow that comes in at low levels from the subtropics toward the equator. It's relatively warm near to the equator, so our thickness is relatively high. You can see the tropopause is elevated here compared to locations in the subtropics, 30 south and 30 degrees north here. And so we have relatively high pressure aloft near the equator. We also have relatively low pressure here near toward, toward the surface. And so air flows into the areas of low pressure and ultimately is forced to ascend. So if we then add in our friend Nermal from the Garfield cartoons here. Nermal was often sent by Garfield via air parcel post, the mail essentially, and often toward Abu Dhabi. So let's use Nermal as a representation of an air parcel that is ultimately ascending within the ascending branch of the Hadley cell circulation here. So given that diabetic heating that's maximized near the equator, Nermal goes upward. But then we know that it hits the tropopause and ultimately becomes no longer positively buoyant. So it spreads out or it diverges. So we have low level convergence and upper level divergence. And that forces normal or our air parcel to go poleward toward the north or toward the south. So let's put normal into motion. 
and we're focusing on the northern hemisphere here, so we send normal off in the upper troposphere toward the north. So we know that there's convergence down here near the surface and divergence up here aloft near to the equator. For air to be converging near the surface at the equator, it must be diverging from somewhere else, in this case from the subtropics. And for air to be diverging aloft near to the equator, it must be converging somewhere else, in this case into the subtropics. And so we get this vertical pattern where we have divergence near the surface and convergence aloft. And this allows us to be able to interpret just what type of vertical motion we would expect to see in the subtropics. So if we take a step here to our continuity equation, this allows us to relate divergence and vertical velocity. Divergence on one side of the equation, vertical velocity over on the other side of the equation. And so if we integrate the divergence, this delta that we have here, from the surface, ultimately up to some arbitrary pressure level, P sub whatever you may wish it to be, we get the following right-hand side equation, where we have the negative of the vertical velocity at that arbitrary pressure level minus the vertical velocity at the surface. But because we assume that the surface is a rigid bound on vertical motions, there's no vertical velocity going up or down across the ground. So we can get rid of that term that we see there. And ultimately we're just left with the negative of the vertical velocity at that arbitrary pressure level. So we integrate upward starting from the surface here at the bottom of our diagram to any arbitrary level. Could be here, could be here, could be here, could be anywhere between the surface and ultimately all the way up to the tropopause. And so in this particular case, we have low level divergence given by the red line here toward the level of non-divergence where it crosses over the zero line. And then we have upper level convergence where it comes back up to the zero line at the tropopause. And so if we integrate starting down here at the surface and going upward, we're adding divergence, adding divergence, adding divergence, all the way up to the level of non-divergence. So this whole entire area between the black and the red lines here is divergence that we are adding to our calculation. And so we have positive for our divergence here and pressure as we're going up, each one of these uh, deltas for the pressure is negative. And so ultimately we have a positive times a negative, which gives us a negative, but we have this leading negative out over here, which means that our vertical velocity should ultimately be positive or descent. And it has its maximum value here right at the level of non-divergence, where we've added in all of the divergence that we have from the surface to that level. As we go further up from there, we start adding in these layers of convergence that we see from that level of non-divergence all the way up to the tropopause that we have up here. So that starts to offset the divergence that we had down here. And by the time we get to the tropopause, we've completely offset it. The areas under the two curves that I've outlined here in red are the same. And so the integral of all of the positive and all of the negative ends up equaling zero. And so our vertical velocity comes back to zero right there at the tropopause. And so this profile of low level divergence and upper level convergence forces de descending motion throughout the troposphere with largest values here in the middle troposphere and smaller values near to the surface and near to the tropopause. And this is a very similar structure to what we see with the subtropical anticyclones. So just reiterating myself there, got a little bit ahead of myself in that regard. So we come back to the Hadley cell and we know that we have this low level divergence and this upper level convergence. So let's put normal into motion and normal is going to go downward and normal goes downward through the course of the troposphere. And that's all well and good. We already knew ahead of time that we would have descent in the descending branch of the Hadley circulation where it's relatively cool in the subtropics. But why and how does descent actually lead to the formation of a subsidence inversion?
So we want to go here to sounding analysis. We've got a blank sounding here between 1,000 and just over 400 hectopascals with all of our usual lines on it. Our isotherms in orange sloped from bottom left to upper right. Our dry adiabats in orange sloped from bottom right to upper left. We have our moist adiabats in green, and we have our mixing ratio lines in the dashed blue lines here. And we know that if we have any ascending air parcel, we're going to lift along a dry adiabat for temperature and mixing ratio line for dew point until we reach the LCL, until the air parcel becomes saturated. But what about descending an air parcel? We always descend along a dry adiabat for temperature and a mixing ratio line for dew point. We immediately become subsaturated once we begin descending, even if we started saturated uh, for a given air parcel. So we can consider this in the terms of a single parcel, or we can do this in terms of a layer. So let's say that we have this layer between 800 and 700 hectopascals here. Temperature is in the red line and dew point is in the dark green line. And we're nearly saturated with a lapse rate that's moist adiabatic over this particular layer. Now recall back to our previous slide, we had divergence with vertical velocity that was maximized in the middle troposphere and less as you went down toward the ground. So let's assume that we want to take parcels at the top of this layer and at the bottom of this layer and descend them down by some amount. But we want to do so more for the parcel that starts at the top than we do for the parcel that starts at the bottom. So for temperature, perhaps let's descend the parcel at the top of that layer by 100 hectopascals, from 700 to 800 hectopascals. But the bottom of the layer, we want to take that parcel and descend it only 50 hectopascals. So we follow along the dry adiabat in both cases, which is given by the thinner black line that I've annotated here. And once we've done that, we can actually add in what the parcel looks like, just connecting the dots between 850 and 800 hectopascals. We've increased the stability quite significantly by descending this layer in this fashion. We were moist adiabatic, so we were conditionally neutral, uh, depending on whether we were saturated or not. Now we have a temperature that is roughly isothermal to slightly increasing, so we are stable in this case. For dew point, we can do the same thing. We can descend the top of the layer parallel to a mixing ratio line by 100 hectopascals and the bottom by 50 hectopascals parallel to a mixing ratio line. And then we can connect the dots between the two and we get that type of dew point structure where it comes very close to following along a dry adiabat. Note how temperature increases rapidly or at least is nearly constant with height and dew point decreases rapidly with height over this now descended layer. This is very characteristic of the subsidence inversions that we see in the central United States during the warm season. We call them capping inversions there and they're much the same that we see over the oceans as well, although the formation mechanisms are just a little bit different there uh, than over the land. And so descent, and this is a key point here, this bottom point that we have here that I'll annotate with a little star. Descent, especially if it's stronger at the top of a layer than it is at the bottom, as we see commonly in the mid troposphere with the subtropical ridge, this causes a layer's stability to increase. And this ultimately is how subsidence inversions form. So it's that subsidence in the descending branch of the Hadley cell circulation that gives rise to this typical capping inversion, subsidence inversion type of structure that we see associated with the trade wind inversion. So we, that helps us answer our first question, but what about our second question? Why are they commonly found over the oceans? And so pulling out some images from that same tropical climatology lecture as before, I have here the climatological mean 200 hectopascal streamlines indicating the horizontal wind field for Northern hemisphere summer. And I want us to pay attention to what happens over land versus what's happening over the waters. Over land, we have these anticyclones, one over Asia and India, one here over Western North America, and one here over Western Africa. But we have troughs, our mid-oceanic troughs, here in the Central Pacific and the Central Atlantic Ocean basins.
In the summertime, the land is relatively warm, but the ocean is relatively cold, especially the eastern parts of the ocean, where we have our cold currents extending toward the equator in both the Atlantic and the Pacific, near to the west coasts of Europe and North America, respectively. So it's relatively cold there, especially compared to the equator, whereas over land, that north-south temperature difference is not as high. And in fact, you have strong heating that gives rise to cyclones near to the surface and anticyclones higher up aloft. Correspondingly, if you look at 850 hectopascals, the pattern is flipped. You get the monsoon low here over Asia and India. You get cyclonic convergent flow here over Western North America, and you get the same here over Western Africa. But you get anticyclones over the subtropical Eastern North Pacific and over the subtropical North Atlantic Basin here. So we have low level anticyclones with divergent flow and upper level cyclones with convergent flow maximized over the oceans because that ocean to equator subtropical to equator temperature difference is greater over the oceans than it is over land during the local summer months. So putting it all together here, summarizing our key elements, these trade wind inversions that we're discussing are subsidence inversions. They form through descent in the descending branch of the Hadley cell. Remember, the Hadley cell is yet another of our tropical circulations that results from diabetic heating. So just as we've reiterated throughout the semester that diabetic heating drives the circulations of the tropics, so too does it help drive the formation of the trade wind inversion through the descent in the Hadley cell circulation. These trade wind inversions are most prevalent over subtropical to tropical oceans, particularly the eastern portions of the oceans, where you have the cooler ocean currents extending from the higher latitudes down toward the equator. They're particularly prevalent during the summertime because you get the greatest temperature difference between the equator and the subtropical oceans during that time. In the wintertime, the oceans are still relatively warm from the preceding summer and the fall, so you didn't, don't get quite as large of a temperature difference. And so ultimately that wraps up our discussion here about what is a trade wind inversion. In our next video, we'll take a look at climatological features of the trade wind inversions, focusing on some data that's nearly 60 years old from the subtropical Eastern North Pacific Ocean. Until then, thanks for tuning in.